All right. Well, this is a big day. Very excited. Welcome, everybody, to our very special webinar, Five Traps to Avoid Before Committing to OKRs. We are privileged, honored, and blessed, <laughs> among many things, to have Larry LaSalle, who's the founder and CEO of Agility IQ. Uh, Larry is one of the most respected and uh, sought after thought leaders in the world when it comes to agile and OKR implementations. He's been in this business for uh, over a decade and he's worked with some of the largest companies in the world, helping them drive cross, cross functional growth uh, results, outcomes, alignment, focus and transparency companies like bank of America, uh, Duke Energy and American Family Insurance. Uh, my name is Jeremy Epstein. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of GTM Hub. And we're very privileged to have you here today, Larry. Uh, let's just jump right into it because well, you know, one, <clears throat> of the, one of the things that we hear from everybody is that OKRs are very simple in concept. I explained it to my 12-year-old the other day. She got it. Yep. But... I mean, of course, she's a naturally very gifted 12-year-old, but she got it. Yep. And, but the challenge we all hear is it's really difficult to execute. We've heard stats like 72% of OKRs fail. We've heard so many of our clients and customers say we've had false starts. Today, we're going to talk about the traps that people fall into, the mistakes that they made, and just looking forward to hearing your knowledge. We've got a great group of people on the call with us today and yep. let's jump right into it. Well, first of all, let me thank you for that very warm welcome. I appreciate that very much. You know, I, I think of it myself much more simply. Um, <clears throat> there's this idea of working in an organization and working on an organization. I work on organizations. So <clears throat> I kind of consider myself just more of a organizational mechanic, if you will. People will come to me, they'll say, hey, you know, work's moving too slow, we're not getting anything done. So I'll pop open the hood, I'll look under the hood, I'll say, hey, looks like your strategy filter is completely missing. So all work is just flowing into your system of delivery. And so we need to fix that. Let's put a filter in there, call it our strategy filter, and filter out some of this work that we're doing that's just the wrong work. So that's kind of what I consider myself doing. I have to go in there and read between the lines and kind of find out what's really the root cause of some of the problems organizations have. So you're kind of like an enterprise mechanic. Yeah, enterprise mechanic. That's exactly I like right. It. That could be your new title. That's free, <laughs> yeah. by the way. You can have that one. <laughs> cool. So, so, so let's let's jump into it, Larry. I mean, yep, um, yep. You know, no one's here to talk about you know our backgrounds or whatever. No one cares. Let's talk yeah. about the the first trap here. Why don't you yep. tell us about that? So this is the first trap of a lot of different types of initiatives that organizations will endeavor to take on. This is the leadership trap. Now, this is an interesting perspective on it because I feel like, you know, those in the OKRs community could be causing a little bit of this trap themselves. Mm -hmm. Because what we find, if you do even pick up any literature about OKRs, one of the very first things you'll see in the opening paragraph is, hey, wild success by Google, Intel, LinkedIn, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. And you look at that and you're like, well, if an organization wants to go off and try and become, you know, wildly successful like these organizations, okay, let's go the OKR route. The challenge though is it wasn't just OKRs that made those organizations successful. It was the leaders behind those organizations that leveraged OKRs to make those organizations wildly successful. OKRs were a part of the way they led and they built it right into the way they, you know, interacted with their leadership team. So they set the, they set the tone. So trap one, leadership, you know, the solution is we need to get them engaged. They need to be the ones kind of leading this initiative. If that's not the case, you know, we're gonna kind of struggle right from the beginning. Yeah, well, let me ask you about this. And, um, you know, you talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. We have some, you know, world-class leaders here on the slide. Are there any um, common traits that you've discovered about the kinds of leaders who are more likely to either 
uh, you know, become a, uh, adopt OKRs to more effectively drive them through organization? Are there, you know, what are, what are the traits that you see among the leaders who are successful in, uh, in, in driving these through the yeah. organizations? Leaders that are, are driving with a vision, leaders that are playing the long game, they're, they're willing to, you know, take their organization on a, on a journey and, uh, you know, they value things like alignment uh, in their, in their organization, clarity of, of the work that we need to be doing. Uh, those are the kind of, of leadership traits that, that you're, that you're looking for. Now, you know, when, when, you know, you go in and obviously, you know, you're part of the, the icon team and you start talking to people come to say, Hey, we're, you know, we want to be like Google. We want to be like Intel. Everybody wants that kind of growth. Are there things that you help your clients and your potential clients um, really look at themselves uh, carefully and, and really do that deep assessment? It's like, do we have what it takes? Do we have the kind of leadership to really make this successful? Like what are some of the, the things that they should be looking? What are the telltale signs that you might advise? Most don't come to you endeavoring to be this grand organization. They just want to be good at being who they are. Mm. And it's, it's, you know, it's, um, you, you definitely have to be willing to have direct conversations about some of the, the things that are happening, but it's the right conversations, right? I mean, you, you have to, we have to talk about how do we ensure that we're doing the right work at the right time for the right reasons? And how do we ensure that the work we're doing is, you know, being accepted and it's valuable for our customers? In that vein, I mean, there's lots of conversations that need to be had with all levels of the organization, but organizations tend to get super tactical. Mm -hmm. And so it's really about kind of installing the right pieces and parts that allows them to continue being tactical. The moment they feel like they have to slow down, it's like they get like a high level of anxiety, you know? Right. So you have to be able to help them keep moving but making small shifts. I, you know, I like to say, you know, change in an organization is like four or five huge giant steps and a thousand little tiny ones. Gotcha. Gotcha. No, that, that's good. One last question in all of your years fighting the battles in OKR. And we should mention Larry, that the nickname that you have in, in the OKR world is Obi-Wan. Because you're, Obi you're, you're like, admit it, right? I called you yeah. Obi-Wan and you said that's what other people call me. So I'm not making this up because you've been there. I didn't, you... if I told you my history with Star Wars, you'd laugh at me. It's not that strong, but nonetheless, you know, people have offered that up to me. We could, yeah, well, I think it's, it's well-deserved. It's well-deserved. Hopefully you, you don't have the same kind of end that Obi-Wan had, but that's a different <laughs> webinar. We're talking about, last question before we move on to trap number two. Have you ever had to have uh, an uncomfortable conversation with an organization saying, look, the leadership here, you guys just, and more gals, sorry, you people don't have what it yeah. takes. For one of the traps coming up that I want to talk about, I want, I'm going to tell you a real short story about kind of uncomfortable uh, you know, conversations. So we can hold to them, that'd be great. But I could tell you that anytime you got to call out somebody at that C level or above about Strat strategic clarity or strategy, it's uncomfortable because, you know, they just, they, there's this inherent sense that I'm in this position I'm in because strategic clarity is what I do, mm. but it's, it's kind of an understanding, you know, versus, you know, execution, so to speak. So for all of our attendees here who are looking to drive this type of engagement in their organization, some of them are in senior leadership positions. Some people may not be any advice you could give them about how to have some of those conversations. So it's not necessarily uncomfortable, but just to make sure that the, the leadership really understands what they're signing up for. Hmm. I think everybody's got to be willing to, you know, when it comes to change, right? Change is not easy for organizations, but what we teach at various levels of the organization is the willingness to, initiate a conversation, the willingness to ask tough questions. Um, generally speaking, leaders aren't going to back down from a tough question asked by someone in the organization. But if they don't ask, then leaders won't have an insight into the things that people are missing. So kind of 
establish an understanding of what it is you think the organization is trying to do and then be willing to drive some tough conversations and ask some 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 challenging questions and then if you're in a a, a, a position of influence at all try to make it work for you so you can start to be an example for others in the organization got it all right leadership trap number one what's trap number two <laughs> So trap number two, a few of these traps, I think, are a little bit, um, there's, there's, there's kind of a lot to them. So trap number two is what we're calling the commitment test. So what we're looking to do with trap number two is what are the signs and symptoms and things that we're looking for in the organization that tell us that we have our eye on the ball. We're doing this for the right reasons. We know the why, the what, the how things of that nature. So the first one of this commitment test is this idea that if I was to cross the paths of anybody in the organization that's responsible for, for funding, you know, for solutions, for execution, if I was to ask them, why are you guys doing OKRs? And they could answer the question from a, you know, from a healthy perspective, something other than because we have to, that's a good, that's a good a good test you know and it's it's a good check the second one is that our path for adopting okrs is clear you know what's expected of me i know what's expected of my team i know when we're going to be doing certain activities i know they'll continue to know the why behind those activities you know and i got the resources that i need to to be good at it and then <clears throat> i know the team that's leading the implementation this is an important one because it starts to give a sense that we're not all off on our own. We're being coordinated and orchestrated by a group of people that bring a special expertise and it gives a level of comfort to kind of, we, we, have, we have a team that really is, is bringing, you know, a, a sense of the how behind, behind all of this. So let me, one question about that one. I mean, when you're dealing yeah. with a company like Bank of America or, you know, those, these are big global organizations. I mean, we work with Societe Generale and CNN and Adobe, some of the largest organizations on the planet, you know, not everybody's going to know the person leading the OKR implementation. How does that sort of knowing the team uh, scale when you're dealing with larger organizations? Well, part of that is scaling that team, right? They should be able to take this team and, you know, depending on how their, their rollout strategy is designed in a larger organization, you know, you're typically going to go through the organization fairly methodically and <clears throat> by line of business or by product line or something, and you're going to do it. It's hard to go big bang in, in a very large organization. So the team that's, that's doing this, you know, they're going to be the ones that are behind the communication. They're going to be the mm -hmm. ones that are behind some of the internal training that's happening, facilitating some workshops and things of that nature. So inevitably, given that this is kind of a commitment test, you know, uh, view of things, we're looking for them to know that team, you know, that's why I like to say, you know, um, in a larger organization, we almost kind of want to have this kind of OKRs management office, so to speak, you know, something that kind of builds it not only as something that we're trying to do, you know, to achieve some specific outcomes, but it's, it's, it's operationalized itself within our organization in an entity that kind of leads it and, key, and makes it stick. Yeah, we tend to call these people the OKR champions, right? And it's almost yeah, like a yeah. team of OKR champions all That's throughout right. the organization. Gotcha. Okay, right. sorry, keep, keep going here. So the communication, you know, you're going to see a thread of this kind of following Kottmeyer, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, John Cotter's model for change is eight steps, right? Where we get down and it says communicate, over communicate from 10 to 100x. So the communication, the, the regular communication is an important piece here where um, you know, like that first OKR cycle to me is critical, right? I want to be get, getting like weekly communication up that for that first month. And then maybe the next six weeks or so, some, I want to get communication every couple of weeks. And then, you know, as we come out of that cycle, again, I want to go back to weekly. And that communication is telling us, you know, what we're going to be doing, when we're going to be doing it. It's starting to share kind of the wins, the challenges, starting to get some of the voice of the teams coming through, sharing their experiences. So communication, um, when we're trying to really institutionalize this and help it to kind of reshape the way we work together is an important piece. Gotcha. Getting trained. <clears throat> um, you know, you talked about OKR champions. You know, we talked about there's OKR facilitators. 
There's the basic, you know, X's and O's understanding of OKRs that everybody needs to have. If we if we have, you know, like you mentioned, uh, you know, OKRs being simple but not easy, I think is kind of paraphrase what you said there. You know, that's the idea is if we go, if we launch ourselves off with too simplistic of an understanding, we're not going to get the essence of what we're really trying to accomplish. And so that's, that creates a challenge. Yeah. That's one of the toughest things I think when you get into OKRs, it's almost like a getting into that Buddha mind, if you will, and just realizing this is a different mindset. It's not just like yeah. a, another ac activity that you're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. I generally describe it as a, a new muscle we need to, need to mm. develop. I'm very picky and, you know, when I use mindset discussions, I got to be deep into a discussion before gotcha. I get the mindset, but new muscle development is certainly, you know, uh, the immediate thing people can relate to. That's our next webinar is the difference between muscle right. and mindset. <laughs> Fine. We'll you do that. It. That's great. Done. Okay. Tools and resources I need to succeed with OKRs. You know, so this is just, you know, like just, I, I know, you know, where I'm going to be keeping my OKRs. I know the people that can support me if I have to tap into a champion or a facilitator, help us with a workshop or understanding, you know, remind me, you know, what a good OKR looks like, how we score them, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, having, having a place to keep them, you know, it's all uh, important aspects to, to make people feel like, okay, you know, I, I can do this. So you're saying that it's spreadsheets, not the place to go? Yeah, we're going to talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, I mean, there's only one yeah. right answer to this one, but we'll save that to later, right? Keep okay. going. Yep. <laughs> Got it. And so leaders are doing company level OKRs. This is the practice what you preach, right? That we're not, we're not telling the organization to do OKRs. We're actually setting an example and we're, and we're doing it at the top. So building on the last one. So, but you know, this being a commitment test, these things being in place are all super important. Uh, to know that, yep, I think we're, we're, we're covering our bases. We're off on the right, yeah. on the right step. So, I mean, one thing you hear from everybody is if you're not committed, it's just not going to work. And I think this is a great uh, list of things to, to, to test whether you are committed. Yeah. All right. Trap number three. What have you got? For well, us? actually, right. we got to go. We got to go. Quickly oh, my bad. Solution. Yeah. I got to carry I'll, I'll away move, there. I'll move through solution because we're offering a solution for each of these. And I know we've got to be trying to answer some time. True. So, so this is what I call the pitfall awareness. It's the Lippitt Noster model for managing complex change. And if you look up at the top, um, the, the area circled in red, that's describing successful change that they put together. Vision, consensus, skills, incentives, resources, action plan equals successful change. Where this gets interesting and why it's the pitfall awareness idea is as you as you move down, if vision is missing and then you go to the far right, you get confusion. If consensus is missing, you get sabotage. And I've seen these. I've seen these. I've pulled this out many times. You know, if incentives are missing, you get. Oh, I'm sorry. Skills are missing. You get anxiety. Incentives. You get resist. Um, yeah, you get resistance. Uh, resources, you get frustration, and then no action plan, you get treadmill. That's why, you know, uh, an action plan just simply is, you know, is a key piece to, to OKR. So this is just a good thing to keep in mind um, when you're when you're setting out on, on, on change, that there is a recipe for success. Yeah, I really like this. I've seen this 10 times, and every time it just sort of helps you understand a little bit yeah. more. But, reinforces yeah. it. No wonder yeah. I feel so much anxiety all the time. <laughs> all right, moving right along here. Okay, now we're going to go to pit. Now we're on to trap number three. Yeah, trap number three. So I, I, I think we we kind of came up with this idea of the floating strategy when we talked about this a little bit. Vague strategy. I call it the one or two word strategies. And so. The reason this is important is because we're, we're trying to establish strategic clarity kind of as an input to OKRs. At least that's, it, that's my sense when I think about doing it, particularly in larger organizations. So you look at some of these like digital experience, you know, if, if, if the first question that comes to mind is what does that mean, you know, or why, you know, those kinds of questions, you know, uh, retention, you know, like what's, what are we fixing? What are we trying to solve for? You know, and that's why when you, when it comes to OKRs, one of the things I like about it in terms of the, the, the right way to do it is, you know, you're, you're having to express a complete thought of intention followed by making it aspirational. So it forces you down this path of really, you know, 
being able to to genuinely communicate kind of the, the why behind it right inherently in it so but uh <clears throat> yeah i call this the 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 vague strategy uh uh trap <clears throat> so the way to fix this now is not what you might expect um i didn't start here in terms of my own sense of of where to fix um uh you know how, how to how to fix the, the vague strategy but uh, it's really for me it's it's using a balanced scorecard and objectives and key results the reason that i like the balanced scorecard is because it it has multiple perspectives that it makes you think through your strategy from multiple perspectives you could go right to okrs at the top but you have some constraints. We're only supposed to do three to five. And you know, so how do we make sure that we've considered our financial perspective, our customer perspective, our operational perspective, and our, our learning and growth perspective? And so, you know, that to me is what helps, you know, get to uh, a good strategy. So it's so, interesting because uh, some people will say, oh, like OKRs are just the the, the latest flavor of some management fad that's balanced scorecard back from Kaplan and Norton in the you know, early 2000s. But you're saying, no, wait a second. These things actually live in perfect yeah. harmony with each other. Oh, yeah, man. Because like <clears throat> when I first started, um, you know, really getting into uh, OKRs um, and, you know, of course, the first thing you got to do is really come up to speed. So you're thirsty for knowledge and you're, you know, you're really out there doing your own research and I did. I saw those. These like, hey, OKRs are better. No, balanced scorecards better. And you know, it wasn't until maybe you know the past year or so where you start to you know see things pop up. Hey, no, these things actually can work together, and there's a reason. And they both fundamentally have the same kind of idea behind them. We're expressing an objective, and then we're going to determine how we're going to measure the objective, and then we're going to develop an action plan to monitor our progress toward those objectives. So structurally, they're not entirely different. I just like the balanced scorecard for, for the particular strategy aspect of things. So, I mean, so OKR is just really just, if you're, if you're already committed to balanced scorecard, it's a great layer to sort of, uh, it's like turbo boosting uh, what you've got. If you don't have balanced scorecard, can you get some of that strategic clarity anywhere? Are you saying they both need to go in there? Cause that's sort of what you're implying here. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just asking. No, no. I mean, I am, I am, I'm making that, I am implying that because I feel like a balanced scorecard alone, you know, like I've known organizations that have a balanced scorecard and then you go into your or, the organization and you just don't see evidence, you know, mm. particularly, I mean, like, I think organizations have a systemic problem of just putting too much work in their system of delivery and too much big pieces of work at that. So you start to see this divergence from, from a, like a operational and execution standpoint from what the strategy was. And, and so you have to be able to use that balance scorecard as a filter, but then continue that alignment and goal setting and, you know, OKRs further down into the organization. Got it. No, got it. All right. So trap real, real number quick, four. This oh, is just sorry. Real, I keep getting ahead. Quick. I'm always excited for the next trap. I sorry. just know that, you know, we got this out there. So this is just there. This is a strategy map view of the balance scorecard. It's a kind of a summary view, but it gives you that idea of those perspectives that you have on the left side and the, the way to think about it on the right side. So we're going to move on. Okay. So <clears throat> this goes to, you know, uh, the idea of, understanding objectives from like a definition perspective. I understand that objectives are, you know, this concise statement outlining an aspirational goal. And I know that key results need to be measurable and they need to tell me what success looks like for those objectives. But if that's all I know, then I, I really kind of, I'm running with a definition. And so remember this was the, this was, we talked about OKRs versus OKR framework, I think. And so this is the, the framework is that I get the purpose. I understand. I get the new muscle development. I understand the behaviors and practices that need to change for this to work. So that's why I say I get and understand the OKR framework definition. You know, it's an alignment and strategy framework that seeks to 
uh, ensure organizational clarity by creating an environment, right? An environment of common goals and shared objectives. That's really kind of the definition I think we need to work with in order to have the conversation about all that needs to really change for OKRs to be more deeply successful and part of the operations of how we work. Yeah, I think you may, I mean, our CEO, Yvonne, likes to say that OKRs are like diet and exercise. If you do them, you're going to be successful. You're going to lose weight. You're going to get better in shape. If you just lift weights, that may not get the job done because you'll go out and have a bunch of ice cream afterwards. But if you understand right. the purpose and the framework and you follow that, like success is basically guaranteed. Yeah. 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 No, I, this is my favorite slide in the whole deck. So <laughs> uh, everyone, everyone can just hang up right now. It's really <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm, this is great. Good stuff. Yeah. Good. So solution, I think the, where, where I like to anchor the solution is in the OKR cycle. And you'll see different versions of an OKR cycle. Some will have four steps, some will have five. Um, but, there, but it's important to understand the OKR cycle because it starts to give you back to that commitment test, this kind of checklist of things that we need to be doing and doing right for OKRs to work. So you establish enterprise clarity. That could be OKRs, that could be a balanced scorecard, whatever it is. Um, but it's starting at the top, enterprise clarity, right? And then you've got this co-creation and localization, which is the, this is the mechanical way that we create our OKRs. We do it horizontally and vertically. We do it with, you know, our groups. This is the co-creation. We do it with groups that we work with. We do it with our, uh, you know, the, the leadership teams above us, the teams that report into us, you know, however we're doing that. And then we localize by creating them as a team, right? The trap, you know, in this space would be managers hand you your OKRs and say, okay, here you go, you're off and running, right? Third step is having an action plan. What are we gonna do? And then more to the new muscle development here is these frequent check-ins and scoring. How are we doing against our OKRs? And then lastly is the quarterly reviews and, and calibrating based on the outcome. What did we learn? What do we need to, what do we need to modify here? What, what conditions have changed from where we started to where we are today that we need to account for as we get into this new cycle. One question on the co-create and localize, because I know I personally struggle with that, especially when I joined GTM Hub and started to get into exercise the OKR muscle, if you yeah. will. My old muscles were, of course, well, I'm the CMO. I'm <laughs> supposed to give you know this brilliant insight about what the team's supposed to do. That's actually 100% wrong. How do you help executives who are, you know, there was a great question here. I saw um, that uh, Adam Kincaid asked about the commitment coming from leaders and how to get leaders engaged and committed when they may not be. Um, not saying that the people in Adam's organizations are there. He's just speaking in hypotheticals, of course. Um, you know, how do you help executives who may not be, have this muscle of allowing everybody, or just saying, here my OKRs, go figure it out. I mean, how do you help people start to build that muscle so they can be comfortable with this co-creation and localization? All kinds of things that you do in that front, right? I mean, there's conversations about, hey, we have to have a systems thinking point of view. We have to think of the entirety of our system and how it works and what are all the moving pieces and parts. We can't just think about the work that we're trying to push through the system without understanding the ability for that system to, to actually deliver on our execution, right? I mean, on our, on our strategies. So you're encouraging the kind of the escalating the view of things and escalating the perspective. So that's kind of one level of discussion. You're having it in a slightly different way. I'm being a, a, you know, a little bit high level with it, but that's kind of the, 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 the sense that you're trying to establish up in the game. But then you go down a, a couple levels and you say, look, we have to intentionally get our leaders out of execution and up into strategy. And, and so here's the things that we need to start to, to do differently so that there's, you know, there's this sense that, that you know, we don't need some executive you know, basically trying to resolve issues at, you know, that are happening in execution, so to speak. We want to get there the, the up a level. So. Yeah, that's been a hard muscle for me to break and build a new one yeah. just because you're you know, it's, it's the it's the it's a proverbial cast of vision mm. and, and 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 be willing to handle the hand the organization complex problems and, and, and solve them. A huge amount of trust has to happen yeah. there. 
Um, so yeah, it's big, but it's rewarding. It's rewarding for the people. Yeah. You know, well, that's what knowledge economy, too. knowledge workers are all about going all the way back to Drucker. So I'm with you. Right. On all right, let's, yep. let's move on here before my okay. team yells at us for going too long. Yeah. Each life. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> the fundamentals are lacking. So the fundamentals piece here is what we're really looking at is just kind of what you might see if you're, if you're learning this from like a best practices standpoint, we've got way too many objectives, right. And key results. Our key results aren't, aren't measurable, you know, or our key results look more like tasks. Like if I see a date in an OKR, it's a huge red flag to me because I know if I read the sentence, it's going to have a task, it's some, some output versus an outcome. And so, and so, so that's a trap. Um, talked a little bit about using spreadsheets, you know, uh, to, to track them. We just don't scale. I like to jokingly say, inevitably somebody's going to start using pink in the spreadsheet too. And then we've got that to deal with. Um, so what are the fundamentals that we have here? Um, there are too many. They're not statements of intent. Um, you know, leadership's not writing them. So just those kind of, you know, fundamental things that we make, need to make sure that we get right. So if you see pink in your spreadsheet, it's time to move on. It's time to move it's on. From this it's over. It, that's like it's the early warning sign of death <laughs> on the horizon. Gotcha. You're flatlining at some right. point. That's right. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. That's and all. And training is. fundamentals. You need to have the training and stuff like that too. So. Gotcha. Fundamentals. So solution. Bring it. Solution. So this is the the have a plan. Have a plan. Follow the plan. Solution to start with. Meaning. You know, everything we kind of talked about, about having a team that leads, having communication, providing training, knowing the OKR cycle, you know, knowing, you know, what this, you know, execution looks like, um, and then providing resources uh, to, you know, help to uh, support teams when, when they're creating, you know, their, their OKRs. So, um, and uh, making sure that we value some of the things that are important in making OKR successful, transparency, alignment, uh, that kind of clarity, you know, knowing that we're trying to get into establishing a new muscle, being outcomes focused, all very important things. So that's solution one. Solution two, training. We talked about training. We gotta be able to get exposed to the big picture of what it is that we're trying to do. Otherwise, I like to say we're taking the long and windy road there. We may never, we may never learn things that we needed to learn in order to, uh, you know, uh, have a full understanding, that full understanding, getting back to understanding the, the purpose. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, we've been relentlessly focused on building the best partner network in in the world and we're honored that you are uh, a part of that and what we have told every single one of our clients is that the software alone even if it's the greatest software on the planet which naturally it is it's not going to get you there it will not get you there unless you do the training unless you have the coaching unless you have all the things that you just talked about like it, it's just too big of a of a new muscle slash mind shift yeah. uh to work. And that's why you have to do this. Otherwise you're going to end up just with a false start, which, you know, is yep. favorite phrase of people who are doing it the third or fourth time. I think it's, you know, it's commendable of GTM hub to have that perspective because it would be all too easy for, you know, to try and just be the best software platform, but to, to help be, you know, uh, a great platform that, 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 you know, understands the purpose behind them and wants to enable organizations to uh, do more, you know, um, I think is, is, it's, it's great. We've actually told, we, I was just talking to our chief revenue officer today and he was saying that we um, were, we just had a, one of our largest uh, deals ever closed, but this was about a year in the making because when they first came to us, as much as they were excited about it, they weren't ready. And yep. we said to them, no, no, no you're, you're not ready for us. <laughs> You need to spend the time working with partners. You need to understand this, get the training first because we would rather you take longer, even though it's not, it's not as much fun for us always. We would rather you take longer because then you will be more successful. And that's where all the work that you've been doing for those years is just so critical. So. I mean, the, the, the bottom line of it, 
you know, I do a ton of work in the agile space. That's more uh, in that space, frankly. But if they don't do it right, they they blame you know agile or they blame OKRs. Right. OKRs don't work for us because of X Y Z. It's really a value alignment conflict, right? They're still valuing something in their organization that's inconsistent or incongruent with the things that need to be valued to make those new, you know, ways of working actually work for the organization. So, well said. Well said. You want to talk to this one, man? Ah, uh, you know, I mean, it's. I don't want to toot our own horn. I mean, look, we're very fortunate to have nearly a thousand organizations around the world, nearly 75,000 different uh, users working with some of the largest organizations, like I mentioned, Adobe and Societe Generale. We just were talking to them the other day. They've grown from one to 50 teams in the last year. And Tom Tom's grown from you know, two to 40 teams in the last year, among others. Just hundreds of people using this. And what everybody says is like, you know, there's that moment where you have the pink in the spreadsheet and you just realize it's never going to work and you need a purpose built OKR platform to allow you to do this and to work cross functionally. Cause what OKRs allow you to do is to unlock the growth from across the organization and to connect these various disparate data silos and, you know, the 160 integrations that we have to support that you'll never get it done. Now I always say everyone's going to use OKRs. They may not use our platform, but they're going to use OKRs and they're going to use a platform to do it. So, you know, hopefully the software speaks for itself, but at the end of the day, every organization in the future is going to use OKRs. They're all going to use an OKR platform and hopefully we have an opportunity to earn their business. We don't need to spend more time on this slide, Larry, but I appreciate the shout out. And there we go. There's, on, there's on, the, about us. <clears throat> we can do about us or if we're out of time, we can go to uh, the, the Q. Yeah, we can so. keep going. That, 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 that's the self-congratulatory logo slide. So we're happy to put that up there to, to show off, but we don't need to spend more time on that. We're honored just to be here and to have you as a partner and to learn from, from your knowledge and experience because it's so helpful for me, especially as we're doing our Q4 OKRs right now. So it's a good yeah. reminder that I need to practice what we preach. Cool. And then some information about us over at Icon Agility. So uh, some of the main things, been in business since 1992, specialized primarily in, in uh, uh, business agility and, and scaling uh, agile in organizations. Um, we are the first uh, gold SPC partner with the Scaled Agile Framework, if you're familiar with that have some safe fellows on staff, some uh, SPCTs, which is a, it's a great accomplishment, over 100 lean agile, you know, coaches and consultants. Um, and, you know, I think we're a thought leader in the business agility space, which is still emerging a bit. And of course, helping organizations implement OKRs at scale. So Thank you for that, Larry. And you def I I'm here to tell you, you are a thought leader in the space and they don't call you Obi-Wan for nothing. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in over the course. I wanted to make sure we get a, a chance. Uh, Steven uh, uh, Starusto, he said, "We look, we mentioned anxiety, and that just could be my East Coast neurotic type A mentality. But I think he, it's something we're all feeling right now, especially now as people are going through, I mean, the last nine months have been changed at, speaking of, you know, Star Wars hyperspeed, what have you. So he wants to know, what suggestions do you have um, to help the majority of people who maybe have never worked remote before for who are doing this for the first time to be able to uh, adapt to this change and to be you know, agile, to, to have developed this new muscle. It's an opportunity, but it's also very, uh, can drive a lot of anxiety. So any thoughts based on your experience? Well, given yeah, what one, gone one, one thing I'll tell you, <clears throat> I like to say that, that in organizations, the smallest atomic unit considered should be team, right? Team. So for people need to be able to work together and collaborate as a unit. And so the remote thing, you know, we have tons of good technology at our disposal, but we need to lean on one another and we need to collaborate with one another. And I think that that's a, that's a big part of it. And we need to make sure that, you know, we've had the opportunity to establish the foundation and we do have the resources that we need in order to be able to get the work done. So I, I mean, those are the, I think some of the fundamentals for me. Gotcha. So uh, just when asked if the, uh, the objective, you know, should it be an aspirational statement that has some sort of 
change beha behavior imperatives for the team as part of it? Like, how do you sort of uh, bring that, those ideas of change of behavior and the OKR aspirational ideas? How, do the, is that, are those two things should be separate? How do you sort of help people think? Well, about I mean, <clears throat> I think, you know, um, the way I look at it, look, it's, it's, it's focus on the outcome, whatever the outcome is that you're trying to accomplish, craft that statement and then ask the question why a handful of times in order to refine it and get deeper and deeper into, you know, what is the true outcome we're trying to accomplish? If we can continue to answer the question why, we're probably not deep enough just yet. That and, you know, include some, you know, some verbs and some specific things to make it feel actionable and, you know, and you use the term aspirational. Um, so focus on the outcomes. Yeah, yeah, no, that's good advice. And when we send out, I know some people have asked about the, um, the recording, which we will send out, we'll also include a link into we have an OKR design score uh, tool that people can use to just practice getting better writing at OKRs. I mean, I know it's, I struggle a lot with writing OKRs well that are effective, that are, that are aspirational. So um, that, I think that that's really good advice. Let me, um, another question just came in here from uh, Hannah. I hope I pronounced that Hannah uh, Marshall. Um, she asked if objectives should be, could be described as stretch goals Are the are objectives stretch goals by another name, or are we confusing to, is that different types of, thinking modalities that are come in conflict with each other? Well, they're not different modalities. I think, you know, the key result is where we want to, you know, we want to stretch. How will we know we were good? You know, we want to, I mean, there's, there's, there's the whole stretch element is there. Um, and so I think the, the, the key result is where I want to see an expression of more mm. stretch because that's what's the measure. That's the outcome that we're trying to accomplish. Um, so if you're asking like, where do we need to stretch? Um, you're going to express that more in the key result because that's where you're going to push your target out a little bit further than uh, what you otherwise would. Gotcha. Now, you don't want success to be guaranteed with OKRs. If success is guaranteed, you've not stretched enough. So you want to you want to leave an OKR workshop or a working session a little bit uncomfortable. You don't want to leave like you know, stressed out, but you want to leave a little bit uncomfortable. That, that, that alone sounds like a change management issue, given that there's so many organizations where if you don't hit your numbers, you know, you're an automatic failure, you're in the bottom 20%. Yeah, that kind of thinking can't live on. We need to be okay with, uh, you know, failure. We need to be okay not hitting the mark in some of these things because we want to be able to learn to get that. We want to be able to learn to get good, right? And, and you're not going to, you know, you don't start out great, right? Yeah, no, that's for sure. Um, all right, another question that came in here. This is great. Uh, but while we're asking, one of our key questions in the chat is, what Netflix series are you currently binge watching, Larry? Is there anything you're... Oh, no, no. So, okay, great question. Um, that's the most important just, question of the webinar. Let's okay, go. I'm not a binge watcher of, of much, so uh, although I have... But I, I'm going to plug in for a great movie I just watched called The Social Dilemma. I watched it on Netflix. That was yeah. an interesting movie, man. That was a really, really interesting Don't movie. Don't even I get me it. started on that one. <laughs> I am totally, totally with you. Um, yeah, that's, that's some scary stuff. Uh, okay, so Amy um, Bowley asks, should all levels of the organization use quarterly OKRs or does it make sense at the higher levels to have annual OKRs that the teams try to make progress on throughout their quarterly OKRs. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so, so the way I like to think about this is the, the KR portion should be quarterly. The objective, you don't necessarily want to just force a change at the objective if there's still benefit to doing it. Just refactor or calibrate your KR portion. That being said, at the top of the house, they'll, they'll generally look and feel more annual based. There's a number of reasons that drive that from funding to other kinds of decisions to existing practices and stuff like that. But, um, you know, so I, I'm less concerned about time boxing the objective and more concerned about mm. time boxing the outcome, the KR portion. That's me. Well, speaking of outcomes, one of our outcomes was to be done at quarter of and as you can see we've failed yeah. 
because we're two minutes yeah. past. So, you know, it was a stretch goal for us because we knew we'd it be was. able to chat a lot. So, you know, 70%, we're almost there. Right. Um, and, I need, and I need 35 seconds because I need to let them know that we have yes, some training available please. for them. So you can look at uh, iconagility.com slash training. You'll find a couple course offerings. We have a one-day facilitators course, a two-day uh, certified coach course. Um, <clears throat> we've got some great things around assessments and stuff we can do. Uh, to help if you're currently doing everybody should just take this right target now. yeah so yeah, just... now i know we're over so we get a 0. 0.7 for our score because we, we get a 0. 0.7 over, so that's we, success we in the okr that's world success. so we did it yes that's for us success. exactly hey. um awesome well larry uh your nickname of obi-wan Pleasure. is well earned yeah you are clearly a jedi of this you've thought about it a lot i'm very grateful to you we're uh, particularly grateful to icon agility for a great partnership and for uh, being the co-presenter, co co-sponsor of this webinar. We're obviously grateful to everyone who joined us. Um, so if you have questions for Larry, for me, or anybody else, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out. You will be getting the follow-up recording. And with that, I think we will say, uh, oh, wait, Jesswin just called me Chewy. I guess that's good. That's a good nickname. Jesswin, you win. Uh, congratulations. You, you win. There you go. Um, that's really good. And oh, last question. Tana Marshall asks, do those classes come with an actual certification? They do come with a certification and a digital Boom. badge too that you can put on your Oh, LinkedIn digital profile. badge. Fantastic. Everybody's, ha everybody's a winner. Fantastic. That's right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining. Cool. Everyone, please stay safe, sane, uh, healthy, all those things that are going on in our crazy world right now. Thank you for joining on us. And Larry, uh, just a pleasure to listen to you and, and bask in the glow of your infinite wisdom. So, thanks, Jared. Thanks, Jared. And your great backdrop. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>